Hi everyone, it's Katrina, the Cannibal King. Unas was the last king of the fifth dynasty of Egypt, the very last ruler of what historians generally agree to be the golden age of the Old Kingdom. Egypt would continue into the sixth dynasty, but that would be the end of their reign as the superpower of North Africa. After the sixth dynasty came to an end, Egypt slipped into their very own dark age. But let's talk about Unas, a fairly mysterious king who we don't know all that much about. He was buried at the southwest corner of the Steppe Pyramid of Dozer, located in the massive archaeological site of Saqqara. It's believed that he ruled Egypt between 2375 and 2345 BC. He had two queens named Kenut and Nebit. Oh, and he may have practiced cannibalism. That last part is a little unexpected, isn't it? And while we have no hard proof of this, we do have the text which was found inside his tomb. One of the inscriptions reads something along these lines. Unas grows in power by eating other gods. He has acquired the hearts of the gods. Their magic is now in his belly. This could be a metaphor for something else, but it almost sounds as if King Unas ate his enemies, swallowed their hearts, and all was part of some insane attempt to gain their power. Pharaoh Pepi II Pepi II was the last ruler of the Sixth Dynasty and the final pharaoh of Egypt's Old Kingdom. With the death of Pepi II, Egypt's true grandeur died, and they were plunged into a terrible dark age, one of many that would come in the following centuries. Pepi II went by the royal name Neferkare, meaning beautiful is the soul of Re. He had multiple wives, many children, and appears to have been a decent ruler, all things considered. He had positive foreign relations with Byblos in Syria and Palestine, discussed peace with Nubia, and even made new links with kingdoms in southern Africa. It was his policy to have peace through pacification, as he believed the ruling class of Egypt could only maintain their wealth if they were friendly with all of their neighbors. He ruled from roughly 2278 to 2184 BC. Egyptologists debate these numbers, with some saying he ruled for 64 years, and some saying 94 years. Whatever the case, Pepi II's power began to diminish in his later years. By this time in Egyptian history, the economy was booming. They had their own breed of capitalism, which was funneling the money from the people into a very small group of rich individuals who owned pretty much everything. This became an issue for the pharaoh. The high officials in Egypt were becoming wildly rich. Control was moving away from the capital at Memphis, and individuals were wielding their own influence. To put it in modern perspective, it would be as if the CEOs of the biggest tech companies suddenly built their own cities and had their own miniature governments to take power away from the capital. And that's what happened here, with the nobles in cities like Akmin, Abydos, and Elephantine building their own palaces and pyramids and tombs. They had so much influence that Pharaoh Pepi II lost his grip on the country, and within a few years, the entire government completely unraveled. The first intermediate period. After the death of Pepi II, the Egyptian government was in shambles. This started the actual Dark Age of ancient Egypt, and it was not pretty. This age is officially known as the First Intermediate Period of Egypt, and it lasted from 2181 until 2040 BC. After the turmoil of the Dark Ages, the Middle Kingdom would start, but never again to this very day has Egypt ever reached the brilliance of the Old Kingdom prior to the Dark Age. So, Egypt Egypt is plunged into chaos. The power, which had been held by the monarchy in Memphis for roughly 500 years, was distributed to lower status people throughout the country. Some of the lucky ones were the mortuary priests, who had been heavily involved in the construction of the pyramids at Giza in the Fourth Dynasty. So many resources had been put into building the pyramids that the priests who took care of the site grew their own kind of cult, almost like the Roman Catholic Church. You could think of the Egyptian mortuary priests like the original bishops at the Vatican. Basically, the pharaoh was no longer in control. The death priests were running wild with power and accumulating wealth, and individual governors were trying to run their own cities like countries. For over a century, there was lawlessness and any harmony was shattered. People no longer felt they were united as one Egypt, but were reduced once more to tribes of bickering states. Deadly Famine In the year 2180 BC, at the beginning of the original Dark Ages in Egypt, famine swept across the country 
country, it was already chaotic because of the collapse of the power structure, and famine only made things a lot worse. Egypt depended on the annual floods of the Nile to irrigate their crops. If there was any change at all in the climate, they were in some serious trouble, and it was right at the start of the Dark Ages that the African monsoons were pushed south out of Ethiopia, meaning the Nile didn't flood, and the crops didn't get the water they desperately needed. Because there was no rainwater coming down from the Ethiopian highlands to seep into the Nile, there was drought for many years. It's not clear exactly how long the drought lasted, but long enough that historians call it the Great Hunger. People were starving in the streets streets. There would have been mass casualties, and all the while the ruling parties were hoarding the wealth so that they could survive while the cities were plunged into hungry anarchy. Quick shout out to Jessica Tyree and Turtle Finks. Thanks so much for watching and supporting this channel. If you are new here, be sure to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already to join the Origins Explained family. The Immigrant Uprising Following the first Dark Ages, Egypt moved into the Middle Kingdom. The pharaohs once more gained a strong grip on the country. The crops were getting watered again, and everything was going smoothly once more as the Egyptians pushed forward into the future. But alas, trouble came once again around the year 1800 BC. Things had been going relatively smoothly for just over 200 years, and then there was some trouble with the ruling pharaohs. One pharaoh after the next proved to be ineffective and weak, and this began a period of turmoil once again. Just before Egypt was plunged into a second dark age, a group called the Hyksos used used the weakness of the pharaohs to seize control of the northern part of the country. This gave the pharaohs only a small piece of Egypt in the south to rule over. But for a long time, historians didn't know who exactly the Hyksos were or where they came from. They had slightly different names than typical Egyptians, and there are theories that they came from somewhere in Southwest Asia. According to Egyptian texts, they were foreign invaders who took the country by force. But some historians say that was all just Egyptian propaganda. According to archaeologist Chris Stantis from Bournemouth University, the Hyksos were immigrants who had been welcomed into Egypt for several centuries and eventually rose to power. In other words, the Hyksos had been migrating into Egypt from an unknown foreign land ever since the Middle Kingdom started. So many of them came that they were able to seize control of the local government and ultimately overthrow the pharaohs. The Second Intermediate Period Starting in the year 1782 BC, shortly after the Hyksos uprising, Egypt did a faceplant into its second Dark Age. It lasted much longer than the first, all the way until 1570 BC. This dark spell is called the Second Intermediate Period, and it was a bit different from the first Dark Age. This time, the Hyksos held power in the north, while the Egyptians held power in the center, at the capital of Thebes. Then, to the south, the Nubians ruled. What happened was that the pharaohs got weak, the immigrants seized power in the north, and the Nubians took their chance to seize power in the south. This left the pharaohs squished in the middle. It was a time of major disunity, with the Egyptian people fragmented and angry, with cultural divisions and anarchic violence. It was also during the Second Dark Age that the Egyptians lost a lot of their culture, such as the ability to write hieroglyphic scripts, art quality suffered, literature suffered, Egyptian religion began to decay, and Egypt drifted further and further from their root heritage. It was also a time of great bloodshed, as each individual faction fought for control. It would take 200 years for the Hyksos to be defeated, and for Egypt to once more be unified. It was Amos of Thebes who achieved the reunification of Egypt, ushering in what we know of as the New Kingdom. The Third Intermediate Period If Egypt was a TV show, the New Kingdom would be the last season. The New Kingdom lasted from between 1570 to 1069. BC, and there was a very brief time known as the Late Period that came after, from 525 to 332 BC. The Late Period was the epilogue of Egyptian history, when Egypt as a force came to an abrupt halt and Rome took over. But between the New Kingdom and the Late Period, there was the Third Intermediate Period. This was the darkest of all the Dark Ages, lasting for over 500 years, as Egypt corroded in a way it never had before. It basically rotted from the end 
inside out. It all started with a division of power. Tanis was the seat of one government, while Thebes was the seat of a powerful theocracy. The high priests ruled Thebes, although they claimed to be ruled over by the god Amun himself. What started as a fracture turned into a total collapse. By the 22nd dynasty, Egypt was fraught with civil war. There were monarchs in just about every major city, including Heracleopolis, Tanis, Thebes, Memphis, Sais, and Hermopolis. Imagine if all the 50 states in the US suddenly went to war with their neighboring states. That was how violent, bloody, and utterly miserable the Third Intermediate Period was. And so, when the Nubians attacked in the 23rd dynasty, Egypt was too weak to fight back because they were already fighting each other. Then the Assyrians invaded, and Egypt was torn. The biggest difference between the Third Dark Age and the other two is that after it came to an end, ancient Egypt as we know it was dead. The First Major Conquest Following the final Dark Age, Egypt was in a strange spot. There were still pharaohs, the Nubians had been defeated, but Egypt just wasn't that powerful. It was around the year 525 BC that Pharaoh Amasis II ruled over the country, while Cyrus the Great was ruling over Persia. Cyrus asked the Egyptian pharaoh for his daughter's hand in marriage, and the pharaoh said no. Amasis was worried that the Persian king was going to use his daughter as a concubine, and it was enough to push the nations into war. In the spring of 525 BC, Egypt was defeated by the Persians at the Battle of Pelusium. That was the defining moment in Egyptian history, as it was the very first time they were actually conquered by an invading force from outside. Cyrus the Great proclaimed himself Pharaoh of Egypt and Egypt became nothing more than a province of the Achaemenid Persian Empire. And from there on out, Egypt continued to be conquered over and over again, later by Alexander the Great, and finally, the last pharaoh of Egypt. Queen Cleopatra was the very last pharaoh of Egypt. Even when Egypt was a vassal state of Persia, there were still pharaohs to hold power for the people. But after Cleopatra, the days of the pharaohs were over forever. Cleopatra was actually Cleopatra VII, and she ruled from between 51 and 30 BC. She was a diplomat, an extraordinarily skilled naval commander, and a linguistic master. She could speak Ethiopian, Hebrew, Arabic, and many more. At the time that she became pharaoh, Egypt had already been ruled over by the Romans for 50 years. She did her absolute best to try and tear away from Roman tyranny, attempting to make Egypt into an independent state. Cleopatra allied herself with Julius Caesar and later Mark Antony and bore four of his children, but Rome would not leave them alone. Augustus Caesar, also known as Octavian or Gaius Octavius, invaded Egypt in 30 BC with the full force of Rome behind him. By the end of that year, Mark Antony and Cleopatra were dead. Egypt was just another Roman province, and that was the end of 5,000 years of ancient history. Egypt in the Middle Ages The Dark Ages in Europe were between 476 and 800 AD. It was considered a time of technological and cultural stagnation, with Rome collapsed and Europe plunged into darkness and anarchy. But what was going on with Egypt in the European Dark Ages? In the early 500s, paganism was outlawed by the Byzantine Emperor Justinian I. This marked the final closing of many temples in Egypt that had been used for thousands of years. Christians officially established the Coptic Church in Egypt in 538. Many Roman temples dedicated to gods like Horus and Osiris were either destroyed or converted into Christian churches. In the 600s, the Persians took control of Egypt from the Byzantine emperor Heraclius. Shortly after that, between 639 and 642, Arab armies entered Egypt under the banner of Islam and captured the country. They created a small garrison town which would grow into the capital of Cairo. And so, this was about the time that modern Egypt was born. Over the next 300 years, Islam washed over Egypt, and the old ways of the gods were abolished. Cairo became the capital, and by the year 1000, just after the Dark Ages had ended in Europe, Egypt was one of the most important centers of the medieval world. Cairo would grow into a city of over 24 million people. The Hanging Pillar There is a small village in India called Lipakshi, and it's home to a plethora of amazing and inexplicable examples of ancient technology. The village is less than 100 miles from the city of Bangalore. Within the village is a miraculous hanging pillar, the footprint of a goddess, and a group of mysterious stone circles. There is a massive impression stomped into the stone within the temple complex at Lepakshi. 
The footprint is roughly three and a half feet in length and was supposedly left by the goddess Sita. Then there is the unbelievable hanging pillar. It's the main attraction of the little village and an unexplainable piece of ancient technology. When India was first colonized by the British, engineers tried to dislodge the pillar from its place, but failed. Even these days, scientists don't understand how the pillar is fixed to the ceiling but doesn't physically touch the ground. It violates every law of gravity, hanging suspended above the stone floor so that you can sweep cloth and pieces of paper underneath it. These stone circles are half mystery and half ancient technology. Much like the goddess footprint, these circles are imprints left in the stone on the floor of the temple complex, but nobody's sure what they are. Each imprint consists of a main circle surrounded by 10 smaller circles, each one perfectly round. It looks as though they were made by some huge piece of machinery, but no one knows what they mean. Leather Scale Armor An almost complete set of leather scale armor was discovered inside an ancient tomb in northwest China. Researchers from the University of Zurich believe the armor originated in the Neo-Assyrian Empire in the 6th century BC, then found its way to China. It was uncovered in the tomb of a horse-riding warrior near Turfan. This was a major technological advancement in the world of warfare. Scale armor was unique in that it protected the vital organs of the warrior wearing it. Scale armor was almost like having an extra layer of skin on, durable yet malleable so that it didn't restrict mobility. The best scale armor was made through a meticulous process of patching together individual plates shaped like shields. These plates were arranged in horizontal rows, and it was a painstaking job. Because most armies were quite large in the ancient world, warriors didn't have access to such lavish forms of protection. Leather scale armor like this would not have been used by the common soldier. This particular set is extremely impressive. It was made around the year 786 BC from 5,444 small scales, each one stitched onto a solid backing. There were also 140 larger scales, altogether creating a waistcoat protecting the torso, hips, sides, and lower back. It would have been shrugged on like a coat. The big mystery is that scientists aren't sure if it was created by a Chinese warrior, stolen from an Assyrian corpse, or worn by an Assyrian mercenary fighting in China for unknown reasons. The Roman Road A Roman road from 2,000 years ago was recently discovered in England in a small town in Worcestershire. Archaeologists say there is nothing else like it except for Pompeii and the city of Rome itself. Workmen digging in a field near an abandoned Roman settlement were the ones who came across its remains. The road is about 9 feet wide, made from large stones laid in the traditional Roman fashion to create a flat, drivable avenue. Local archaeologist Aidan Smith believes it's definitely a Roman road from the 1st century AD, which will make it the only one of its kind ever found in Britain. But 2,000 years ago, this road was only one piece of a much larger network connecting various Roman cities and towns. The technology was so advanced that the road remained hidden under several feet of dirt for thousands of years and is still almost in perfect condition. These stones were placed with expert precision, made specifically for wagons and convoys. People would have been able to walk these roads and feel relatively safe while journeying from one destination to the next. This was a major upgrade from having to travel along dirt paths through the woods and potentially be robbed. The old adage, every road leads to Rome, is because the Romans really did create the first superhighways. Their roads across Europe connected the continent in a way that had never been done before, allowing for easy travel and increased trade. But it's the durability of the roads that really speaks to their technological prowess. Most modern roads crack and break within a few years, but Roman roads last for centuries, with barely any damage. The Balancing Rock Another ancient wonder in India is a thing called the Balancing Rock. It's located in Malinong and consists of two stones. One of these stones is a huge boulder, and it balances perfectly on the significantly smaller stone beneath it. According to local lore, the balancing rock has been in the exact same precarious position for centuries. No storm has ever been able to topple it. The stone itself is surrounded by bamboo plantations, 
and there are even rumors of creepy rituals. 1,000 years ago, the Balancing Rock was the preferred place for human sacrifices to appease local deities. The practice only fell out of favor when Christianity was introduced to the region. Unfortunately, we still don't know what's happening with the Balancing Rock. Most scientists agree it's most likely just a natural formation and a complete coincidence. Others think it's an example of advanced ancient technology. The rock looks like it should fall over at any second, but it never does. Big thank you to Chris Bodden and Candace Perry for supporting this channel. If you are new here, be sure to hit that subscribe button for more videos like these. The Solar Barge Around the year 2500 BC, a mysterious ship was sealed inside of a secret pit at the foot of the Great Pyramid of Giza. The ship was part of the extensive list of grave goods buried in and around the pyramid for Pharaoh Khufu to use in the afterlife. At 4,500 years old, the Khufu ship is one of the oldest sea vessels from the ancient world, hailed as a masterpiece of ancient woodcraft. It's 142 feet long, 19 feet wide in the middle, and is currently accepted as the oldest intact ship in the world. It was relocated to the Grand Egyptian Museum in 2021. It's in such perfect condition that if it were put into a body of water today, it would sail with no problem. It's still completely seaworthy. The exact function of the ship is still unknown. Archaeologists believe it was a solar barge, a kind of ritual vessel with a very specific purpose. It may be that the ancient Egyptians believed such a barge could carry the dead king across the heavens when he met the sun god Ra in the afterlife. But there is one thing that really throws a wrench into this theory. The solar barge shows obvious wear and tear, suggesting it had been used a lot before it was buried at the foot of the pyramid. It may have been instrumental in building the pyramid, perhaps used to transport blocks from quarries to the build site. The Hipparchus Star Catalog Researchers affiliated with the University of Cambridge recently discovered fragments of an ancient manuscript about 2,100 years old. It's called the Hipparchus Star Catalog, authored by the brilliant Greek astronomer Hipparchus between 170 and 120 BC. The paper is the oldest known piece of evidence in which a human used numerical coordinates to try and pinpoint the exact position of a star. This was a major innovative breakthrough in the realm of astronomy. The text was unfortunately erased several centuries later so that the pages could be reused. Researchers only identified the fragments of text by using multispectral imaging technology. They had to look underneath the scribblings of ancient astronomer Claudius Ptolemy, who had written over Hipparchus's work 400 years later to make his own catalog. What's a little ironic about the situation is that Hipparchus' measurements were more accurate than the man who copied over his manuscript. Hipparchus successfully detailed the celestial longitudes and latitudes of almost 900 stars in the night sky. This wasn't exactly an ancient technology, but it was a huge leap forward in mathematics and star science. And it was all done by one man with a primitive telescope and an instinctive understanding of the cosmos. Stonehenge Engineering Secrets Stonehenge was not built in a day. Archaeologists agree it took at least four main phases to complete the famous megalith located in the English countryside. Work began roughly 5,000 years ago, and the Neolithic builders finished their masterpiece 1,500 years later. That's hard to grasp in the modern mind, a single building project ongoing for over 15 centuries. And throughout it all, the ancient builders used primitive tools crafted out of stone and deer antler. But what was the secret to the longevity of Stonehenge? It's been standing erect for an extremely long time, seemingly impervious to the wear and tear of Mother Nature. Archaeologists believe the endurance of Stonehenge can be attributed to a clever ancient building technique. These stones were interlocked by using drilled holes and protruding pieces. Think of Lego. Each huge piece of stone either had holes for fitting the studs or it had studs for fitting into the holes. When the stones were put in position, they interlocked just like perfectly matching Lego pieces or Lincoln logs. Experts call it a mortise and tenon system, and it goes to show just how incredibly brilliant the builders of Stonehenge were. 
The smart idea is also the only thing keeping 17 of the original stones standing upright, with five of the capstones still in their original position from five millennia ago. Roman Surgery In the year 79 AD, Mount Vesuvius erupted with all the fury of the gods. The Roman city of Pompeii was buried under multiple layers of ash, preserving the city in stone as its residents and buildings were frozen solid. The Roman city of Herculaneum suffered the same fate. When archaeologists excavated these two petrified cities centuries later, they found artifacts from ancient Rome preserved as if they had been made yesterday. Some of these artifacts were surgical instruments, highly advanced medical tools recovered from a structure in Pompeii known as the House of the Surgeon. The collection of surgical tools taken from the house is now considered the best surviving example of surgery equipment from the 1st century AD. What's really shocking is that medicinal practices in ancient Rome were highly advanced. Some of the tools they used didn't change until late in the 20th century. Specifically, surgical tools used in gynecological operations were almost identical to the tools doctors are still using today. Then there are other, more bizarre surgical instruments. The bone forceps were used for removing pieces of the human skull during cranial surgery. The portal probe case was taken by surgeons to do house calls. The probe case contained all the necessary pokers and probes used by doctors to make diagnoses. Roman surgeons used obstetrical hooks for raising blood vessels and small pieces of tissue. They used epilation forceps for the removal of hair and they had scalpels, surgical scissors, dozens of different probes, and lots of other stuff. They were almost better equipped than a lot of modern doctors. The Stairway of Fountains About 550 years ago, the great Inca city of Machu Picchu looked a lot different than it does today. Along the steep ascending staircase moving through the ancient city to its peak, there are currently empty square chambers covered by short grass. But in the year 1450, when the city was powerful, the stone squares were part of an impressive engineering project. On either side of the stairway was a network of water fountains, 16 in total, which worked to supply fresh drinking water for the residents. The fountains also would have been quite the sight to behold. They were powered by what may have been the most advanced example of hydraulic engineering in South America. The incredibly genius Inca engineers built a permeable wall, which worked to connect seeping water into a stone canal. The canal was also connected to a spring to help collect even more rainwater. Water was then pushed through Machu Picchu in a canal roughly 5 inches deep, carrying an estimated 80 gallons per minute. Charles Ortloff, a professional hydraulic engineer, says no other royal residences or Inca settlements boasted anything like it. The canal system was totally unique to Machu Picchu, passing through the outer wall, through agricultural zones, and into the residential zone. That was where the water flowed into the 16 fountains, each of which was publicly accessible. The cascade of water dropped a total vertical distance of 65 feet down to the last fountain, located within the Temple of the Condor. The Wheel There has been no greater invention in human history than the wheel. Some could argue antibiotics, the telephone, the light bulb, but the wheel was truly one of the first great inventions and a major game changer. Nobody knows exactly when it happened, but archaeologists have a pretty good idea. Surprisingly, it was fairly late. People invented sewing needles and basket weaving, they built boats to sail across the ocean, humans played music from primitive bone flutes, and all the while, for thousands of years, nobody figured out how to make a wheel. The very first wheels weren't even used for transportation. Around 3500 BC in Mesopotamia, wheels were first used for pottery. It took about three centuries before humans realized they could use them to make chariots, creating the world's first horse-powered vehicle. Wheels then revolutionized the globe. The best example comes in the form of the wheelbarrow. Around the 6th century BC in classical Greece, Someone realized they could put a wheel on a bucket and save themselves a lot of time moving material. Wheelbarrows were incredibly expensive to purchase, but paid for themselves within a week. Being able to move a full load in a bucket attached to a wheel saved an unprecedented amount of time. 
The wheelbarrow was likely one of the first major technological advances that cost laborers their jobs. Roman weaponry. A trove of ancient Roman weapons has been unearthed at a prehistoric settlement in Spain. It's called Son Catlar, and it's on the Balearic Islands. The site is famous for its preserved fortifications, as well as its deep Roman roots. Researchers surveying the ancient settlement found a small cache of Roman military equipment dating back to roughly the year 100 BC. These researchers, scholars from several universities in Spain, didn't just discover swords and spears, they found an entire arsenal. Projectiles, knives, arrowheads, and even ordinary military supplies like surgical implements and cooking equipment. Son Catlar was occupied by the Talayotic people and was the largest of their settlements. It boasts a perimeter wall of nearly 3,000 feet around that's the size of an NFL football field. It also had Talayot's towers, which are what gave this prehistoric society its name. So how did Roman weapons end up in the settlement of a relatively unknown ancient society? It was all because of their conquests. Roman soldiers conquered and occupied this Spanish island, wiped out most of the people, and garrisoned themselves there for decades. The whole place was eventually abandoned and the Romans left a lot of their fighting supplies behind. The Romans weren't the last people to occupy the islands. After the defeat of the Romans, the Vandals came. They were a Germanic tribe who sacked Rome, battled the Huns and the Goths, and founded a kingdom in North Africa. That empire flourished for about a century until it fell to an invasion force from the Byzantine Empire. History has not been kind to the Vandals. Then the Moors took control of the island, and finally the Spaniards, and all left their mark on this ancient settlement. Fish Scale Armor Inside a Chinese tomb, archaeologists uncovered fish scale armor, once worn by an ancient warrior. Researchers believe this fascinating armor is a rare example of blended technology between the East and West from 2,500 years ago. The armor is quite complex. It's made of over 5,000 overlapping leather scales, complete with intricate and expert craftsmanship. The warrior who once wore this incredible armor had probably put the garment on like an apron. They would have slid it over their head, fastened some ties, and been ready for battle. It was a unique design when it was made because the Chinese weren't using this type of armor. Instead, the idea probably originated from the Middle East. The armor was discovered inside an archaeological site near the city of Turfan, which is on the fringe of the Taklamakan Desert. Because of its 5,000 scales, it would have offered exemplary protection primarily against blunt force attacks, piercing attacks, and arrows. Inside the grave, archaeologists also found the remains of the man who probably wore the armor, a man estimated to be around 30 when he died. They also found a sheep skull and some fragments of pottery. Now here's something really cool about ancient scaled armor. The material used for the scales vary dramatically. Sometimes they use pangolin scales, or paper, bronze, iron, and even leather from various cattle-like animals. Each material offered distinct advantages and disadvantages. They would even make these armor sets for their horses to protect them when they rode into battle. The Egyptians used scale armor, like a piece found in the tomb of Tutankhamun, and the Scythians used similar armor, and so did the samurai in feudal Japan. Three generations of women warriors. Inside a Russian tomb, archaeologists have discovered three generations of ancient Amazonian women warriors. According to the Russian Institute of Archaeology, their researchers uncovered the remains of four Amazon women, each a different age, but all buried in the same tomb. It's the first time in history that this kind of surprising discovery has been made. One girl was between 12 and 13 when she died, the second was between 20 and 29, the third between 25 and 35, and the fourth was between 45 and 50. That's three generations of Amazonians. How do we know they were warriors? It's all because of items discovered at the burial site. Archaeologists uncovered iron arrowheads, knives, animal bones, horse harnesses, and hooks made from iron. Since they were from the 4th century BC, the artifacts helped to date the burial. The artifacts also suggest that these women were warriors. The horse harnesses had likely been used while patrolling the countryside on horseback. They had probably been experienced archers, considering the arrowheads. If you're unsure of who the Amazonians were, here's a bit of background. They are also known as the Scythians, and they were nomadic people who lived across what is now Russia and parts of Central Asia over 2,500 years ago. The culture is famous for its women warriors, 
and was actually the inspiration behind Wonder Woman and the Amazonians of the DC Universe. Migration Period Sword The Migration Period Sword was extremely popular between the 4th to 7th centuries. It was really big with Germanic people and got its inspiration from the Roman sword, the Spatha. It would ultimately be the inspiration for the Viking sword in the 8th century, and was one of the most heavily used weapons of the Merovingian period. But there aren't too many examples of this type of sword left today. While the blade was forged to be smooth, broad, and made with multiple layers of metal, the handles were usually built of wood or another perishable material. So over the past 1500 years, most have decayed. The majority of surviving examples have been found in Scandinavia in the form of ring swords. Ring swords were a particular variant of the migration period sword. They had small rings on the hilts and weren't as pointy as you would expect a sword to be. The tip ended at a kind of dull arc and wouldn't have been very good for stabbing. Instead, these were slashing swords, heavy and sometimes so blunt they were basically used like clubs. A handful have been found in England, Germany, and Scandinavia. One of them was found in a tomb in Bavaria from around 620 AD, engraved with four runes in the shape of a Christian cross, a surprising blend of Old Norse customs and newer Christian symbols. Tang Dynasty Armor In 2019, archaeologist Zhang Wei was investigating a mysterious tomb complex found in China. When he entered the burial room, he discovered a massive iron object lying on the coffin bed. He didn't immediately recognize it, but he soon found out exactly what it was. The only complete set of iron armor from the Tang Dynasty ever discovered in the country. This was a fascinating find, as the warrior's armor was crafted sometime between 618 and 907. It was such a rare discovery that it was taken away to a lab, where for nearly two years, archaeologists painstakingly went through the restoration process to bring the armor back to its former glory. The complete set consists of over 2,000 individual iron plates, and in the beginning, the restoration team had no clue how to put them back in the right order. They had to look at historical documents, ancient murals, and other visual aids for help. It was kind of like trying to figure out a 2,000-piece puzzle by looking at the picture on the front of the box. One reason armor and weapons are so rare to find from the Tang Dynasty is that they had a law restricting military material from being buried with a person. The only difference in this case is that the man who was buried was General Murong Zi, a legendary warrior and one of the highest members of society. He was given a pass, allowed to be buried with his impressive set of iron armor which, by the way, was significantly better than the flimsy armor the common soldiers had worn. Which culture do you think had the most impressive armor? The Greeks, the Chinese, the Romans? Let me know your thoughts in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Forgotten Warrior Tribe In a medieval cemetery in eastern Poland, archaeologists recently discovered some very rare warrior weapons. Swords, spears, knives, along with hundreds of other fragmented items. What makes this discovery unique is that the weapons belong to a famous warrior culture from 1,000 years ago called the Jotwingians. They lived in the Suwalki region of Poland, a Baltic people with cultural ties to both the Prussians and the Lithuanians, yet they spoke their own unique language, kind of like Old Prussian, but a little different. These fearsome warriors had a good run during the Middle Ages but like so many small cultures were absorbed into the larger Slavic and Germanic cultures that surrounded them. This discovery of weaponry came from the biggest Jotvingian cemetery from the Middle Ages. According to archaeologist Jerzy Saimasko, they occupied this area between the 11th and 13th centuries and used this enormous cemetery for burial rituals. They would create massive funeral pyres, dump the dead bodies of their warriors into the flames, and then throw gifts for the dead into the fire. The enthusiasm created by the find has been moderate because treasure hunters seem to have gotten there first, stealing about 1,000 items, even though such activities are illegal, and bring with them a prison term of up to 10 years. The region of the discovery is now protected, and its location is kept secret to prevent further theft. The Golden Sword The burial site of an ancient nomadic warrior was recently found in Ukraine. Within the burial, a remarkably well-preserved short sword gilded with gold was found. The archaeologists were working at Mount Mamai, a massive burial site north of the Black Sea, 
and one of the biggest in the entirety of Europe. It was used for several thousand years, from the start of the Stone Age to the introduction of the Classical Era. There have been over 700 individual burial sites found at Mount Mamai, at least 400 of which are Scythian. This place is so big that for 32 consecutive seasons, archaeologists have been busy digging up graves. This most recent grave belonged to a young Scythian fighter. He was around the age of 18 when he died and was buried with buckles for horses, an axe, some arrows, and the most impressive discovery of all, a traditional Scythian short sword called an Akinak. Even though the weapon was heavily corroded, it was still in decent condition. It was once gilded with gold, suggesting the warrior who wielded it was also a young man of great wealth and prestige, and he was only 18 years old. The items have been removed for further investigation and preservation. All the artifacts, including the gilded short sword, will ultimately be put on display at the Museum of Local History. There are more digs planned at the massive site, and more burial places and treasures to be found. Lost Roman Dagger Nico Kalman, an archaeology intern with the Westphalia Department for the Preservation and Care of Field Monuments in Germany, that was a mouthful, made a fantastic discovery. He came across a silver Roman dagger dated 2,000 years old, and this was no ordinary ornamental dagger. It was likely used in the 1st century AD while the Romans waged war against a Germanic tribe in the north. The knife was found still in its sheath buried in the grave of a warrior at the archaeological site of Haltern at the lake. The dagger comes from the Augustan period between 37 BC and 14 AD. During this time, Haltern on the lake was home to a military base of about 20,000 Roman soldiers. It was at the very fringe of the Roman Empire, with nothing but the barbaric Germanic tribes beyond. When those tribes marched south and took on Rome and all her might, this military base was not prepared. In the year 9 AD, the tribes swept through the region and all 20,000 of the soldiers were brutally slaughtered. They were a lonely military force at the edge of the empire, with no reinforcements and no way to take on all the tribes of the north at once. The only thing about the dagger is that it probably didn't see that much action. It was small and only useful at close range. It would have been a backup weapon, dangling from the soldier's belt, deployed only when he had lost all other weapons and was forced into savage hand-to-hand -hand combat. It was not the usual practice for Roman soldiers to be buried with their military gear, and the researchers were unsure why the weapon was buried along with its owner. Now removed from its tomb, the dagger will soon be displayed in Haltern's Roman History Museum, beginning in 2022. The Eagle Warriors The infamous Eagle Warriors of the Aztecs were elite infantrymen unlike any other fighting force of the ancient world. These warriors had distinguished themselves as masters of the battlefield, which elevated them from being mere soldiers. They were brought into an elite warrior society, with the members often being raised to nobility even if they had started as commoners. Land was also given to the warriors. This property was tax-free, and whatever profit that was made from it belonged to them. The gift was for life, and could be passed on to their successors. Although they were full-time soldiers, the Eagle Warriors were also involved in politics. In the Aztec language, they were called Quahitli. These warriors even dressed like eagles when they went into battle. They wore eagle feathers and had helmets with huge eagle beaks on the front that they could see out of while fighting. Out of all of the warriors I've told you about, the Aztec special forces were some of the most terrifying to behold on the battlefield. They had quilted cotton armor decorated in eagle fashion and a round shield adorned with many feathers. It was no simple task to become an eagle warrior. While we don't know for sure what all the requirements were, we have some idea. Most sources agree that a single warrior needed to capture at least 20 enemy warriors within two consecutive battles, and they had to capture them alive. Ancient Romanian Sword In Romania, a sword over 3,000 years old was just discovered in a gravel pit. A worker was busy sifting through the pit in the small city of Buzau when he came across the ancient weapon. It was being pulled across the conveyor belt with chunks of gravel. It couldn't have been any easier to find, although if he had looked away for just a second, he probably would have missed it. The bronze sword is interesting because it appears to have been made inside of a mold. Thousands of years ago, a blacksmith had perfected his craft, made himself a mold to make sword making easier, and then started distributing the exact same sword. 
You might find this fascinating because we often think of ancient blacksmiths as bashing metal into a form on an anvil, building everything from scratch. But even 3,000 years ago, experts had efficient ways to mass produce the most valuable things in society, like deadly weapons. We don't know exactly who the sword belonged to. It may have been a nobleman, but it was probably a warrior. Archaeologists suspect whoever had wielded the sword was buried with it, meaning their skeleton is probably lost somewhere still in the gravel pit, or it's been mashed into gravel and is dust in somebody's driveway. The Mountain City of the Dead there is a dark and mysterious place in the Russian mountains that locals call the City of the Dead. It can be found just outside the extremely isolated village of Dargavs. And although the people call it a city, it's really a necropolis. The ancient cemetery holds the bodies of over 10,000 medieval people, and many of these individuals were buried under strange circumstances. Their bodies are still dressed in ordinary clothing, and a lot of them still have the belongings they were buried with. The use of the cemetery dates back to the 16th century, when the farmland in this part of southern Russia was turned into a burial ground, although nobody's really sure why. Some historians figure it's because after the 13th century invasion of the Mongols, not many people were left living in this stretch of Russia. Locals in the deep valley of the Caucasus Mountains built above-ground crypts because they couldn't be bothered to go through the trouble of burying their dead in fancy underground tombs. It may also have been a lingering tradition from Iran, brought over by the Iranians who migrated north. All we really know is that there are over 99 medieval crypts in the City of the Dead. Many of the corpses here are so perfectly preserved they still have flesh on their bones. We also know that during the 17th century, a series of plagues swept across the area. And because of this, local residents quarantined themselves inside the crypts with the corpses of their deceased relatives, with many of them never seeing the sunlight again. The Royal Observatory The Cheongseongdi Royal Observatory was one of the most impressive astronomical tools in Korea from the Dark Ages. The observatory tower was built during the reign of the mighty Queen Sion Duke, who ruled between 632 and 647 AD. This was just before the Silla Kingdom reached its greatest height and took control of the entire Korean peninsula, bringing the area's warring factions together. The capital city at Jiangju was already a bustling hub of culture, artistic expression, and scientific endeavors. Early Koreans were advancing quickly with subjects like mathematics and astronomy. So, Queen Sion Duke wished to continue supporting the sciences. She ordered the construction of the greatest observatory tower in the kingdom, allowing scientists to truly study the celestial bodies of our solar system. However, not everything was purely scientific in the 7th century. Much of Korean culture was still ruled by the effect they believed the stars and planets had on their lives. They weren't trying to figure out the mass of Saturn. They mostly wanted to know what the planets were doing so they could make predictions about the future. It was technically science, but it wasn't astronomy. It was extremely complex astrology. The observatory itself still stands after 14 centuries. It's 29 feet tall and constructed from over 362 massive rectangular-shaped stone blocks. Most historians agree the number of blocks is symbolic of the number of days in a year. The blocks, which are arranged in a circular pattern made of 27 courses, are believed to be symbolic of the queen being the 27th monarch of the kingdom. And the 12 layers of brick above and below the tower window likely represent the months in a year. However, not everybody believes the tower was used for observing planets. There is an alternative theory which states the observatory tower was built as a temple for the Mesopotamian goddess Ishtar, who could have been worshipped by Queen Sionduk herself. The Baths One of the most popular places to visit in England is the city of Bath. It's called Bath because of the Roman baths upon which its foundations were made. The land was initially inhabited by the Iron Age tribe known as the Dobuni. They came across a natural hot spring and dedicated it to their primitive goddess, Sulis, who was believed to have magical healing powers. Then, in 43 AD, when the Romans invaded Britain, they transformed the sacred hot spring into a spa complex. 
They used it to create some of the most luxurious baths found anywhere throughout the Roman Empire. The religious site became a social center for Romans, who traveled from far and wide to take a spa weekend in the city. Even by today's standards, the Roman baths here would have been marvelous. They figured out how to use hot mineral water rising through the limestone to heat their baths to perfection. Water traveled through lead pipes, heated the floors underneath stone rooms, and supplied never-ending hot water for what were basically ancient hot tubs. There were also religious temples. Romans could take esteem and socialize with their comrades before giving praise to the gods at the temples outside the baths. Unfortunately, the whole place fell into disrepair when the Romans were forced to withdraw from Britain in the 5th century, and local flooding saw the baths completely destroyed. And then, something strange happened. Over 1,000 years later, doctors started drinking the water from the thermal springs as a way to cure illnesses. These physicians built a pump room in 1706 so that their patients could easily access the water. And in 1878, locals in the city rediscovered the ruins of the baths. It would take over 100 years, but they were eventually restored to their former glory. The site now attracts more than 1 million visitors annually, making it one of the most popular attractions in England. Have you been there? Let me know in the comments. El Castillo El Castillo, also called El Templo or the Temple of Cuculcan, is a magnificent steppe pyramid that dominates the skyline of the archaeological site known as Chichen Itza in Mexico. It was built by the Maya civilization over 1,000 years ago. Researchers believe construction started on the pyramid around the 8th century and continued for 400 years. It then served as the main place of worship for Cuculcan, who's known as the feathered serpent deity, supreme god of the Maya world. But why did the Maya create pyramids to worship their gods? Nobody really knows, but there is one popular theory. The Maya may have been trying to get as close to the heavens as they could, and they did this by building huge step pyramids. It could have been constructed as a staircase to the gods, which was built nearly 100 feet tall. It's decorated with sculptures of feathered serpents running along its sides. It even casts shadows during the spring and autumn equinoxes that look as though a snake is crawling down the temple. This is such an intense phenomenon, people specifically time their visits to Chichen Itza just to see it. But there is still one more shocking fact about El Castillo. Scientific research has shown that the temple could mimic the chirping sound of the local Quetzal bird when people clapped their hands near it. Some say it's just a coincidence, but others say the Maya somehow did it on purpose. I want to give a big thank you to Real Life and Marco Calilao for supporting this channel. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already and join the Origins Explained family, because why not? Harry. Harry, located in modern-day Turkey, is an ancient city that came into the history books during the Kingdom of Kavajin, around 163 BC. However, keep in mind that this city was already inhabited during the Stone Age, when human beings had yet to develop anything more sophisticated than a sharp rock. But it wouldn't be until thousands of years later that Perry became a modern city. It grew quickly and prospered because it was an important stop on the route between Samsat and Malatya. Armies, trading caravans, and dignitary parties alike would have all stopped here to take a break during their long journeys. Travelers had a particular fondness for the city of Perry because of its natural spring. This wasn't a hot spring like the one in Bath, though, because it was fueled by fresh mountain water. The spring still gushes out from a Roman fountain in the middle of the ruined city today, still cold and refreshing. Even with the collapse of the Comagene, the city continued to flourish. The roads that were already built were taken over by the Romans, and the metropolis continued to thrive throughout Christian times and into the Byzantine Empire. However, by the Middle Ages, Modernism had buried the ancient ruins under the present-day town of Adiyaman, Kawachi Necropolis. When you hear the word Nazca, there's likely one thing that comes to mind, the Nazca lines in the desert of Peru. But many people forget that the Nazca was a real civilization that dominated the hot and inhospitable desert of Peru 2,000 years ago. The Nazca didn't just carve mysterious geoglyphs into the dirt, 
They built great cities, made pottery, and even had their own religion. We don't really know what their religion was or what their beliefs were, but we do know about the ceremonial center of Kawachi and its terrifying necropolis. Around 200 BC, Kawachi became one of the most important places for Nazca culture. It was here where people from all across the desert came to celebrate harvest festivals. It was also a site where people buried their dead and would gather to worship their lost ancestors. Archaeological excavations have revealed no sign of habitation because this was a strict religious site. There wasn't any trash or everyday objects left behind, and not a single dedicated residential area was discovered. Only pilgrims came here, but their visits were short and they slept in tents. There was only one building and it was likely used as storage by the builders who cared for the massive plaza and the crypts of the dead, along with the sacred road through the desert. Fatehpur Sikri Fatehpur Sikri is an ancient city that was built by the Mughals of India a very long time ago. It can be found outside the modern city of Agra. It's rich in history and has been inhabited since at least 1200 BC. It became one of the most important places in the Mughal Empire under Emperor Akbar the Great, who turned it into the capital in the 16th century. No place else in India can you see the true scope of just how grand and flamboyant the Mughal kings were. The red architecture of this city is like nothing else on the planet. It was built to be majestic in every sense of the word, with vivid colors and magnificent gardens filled with beautiful green plants. The metropolis also had flowing water everywhere you looked, and yet the city only served as the capital of the empire for 14 years. This was because, after almost 2,000 years of habitation, this city was abandoned. The people moved to Lahore in 1585, leaving the stunning red city of Fatehpur Sikri in the hands of Mother Nature. It wouldn't be occupied again until the British came to India and used it as a military outpost. Bighorn Medicine Wheel One of the most mysterious places in the United States of America is the Bighorn Medicine Wheel. It's one of the few Native American complexes that survived the colonization of the Americas. Long before Europeans landed on American soil, the Bighorn Medicine Wheel was used by a variety of different tribes. The site stretches over 4,000 acres, with the medicine wheel at its center. It's one of the biggest stone wheels in North America and sits at an altitude of 9,600 feet. It was built in the direct sunlight high up on Medicine Mountain. But what in the world was it used for? Based on reports from the U.S. Forest Service, estimates vary on the age and use of the medicine wheel. Some experts have guessed it could be a few hundred years old while others believe it's over 3,000 years old. But oral histories of Native American groups say it could be even older than that. According to them, the site has been visited for almost 7,000 years. As for its use, that's been studied since the 1990s. Anthropologist James Boggs believes the medicine wheel and others like it were used in a wide variety of ceremonies. It may have been a kind of hub for ritual activity. People would have traveled to the mountain in order to camp at the medicine wheel. Then they likely participated in anything from a spiritual quest to a group prayer. It apparently wasn't used for any particular ritual though. It was a shared sacred place where any kind of important activity could happen. The Library of Celsus The Library of Celsus can be found in Western Turkey, but today it's nothing more than a busted ruin from the days of the Roman Empire. It was constructed in the 2nd century AD and was named after Roman governor Celsus himself. These days, only a single facade remains. Three of its walls have crumbled and the ceiling is no longer intact, and there's only a single unstable wall to show how impressive the building once was. However, it wasn't the shell of the building that most people are interested in. It's the estimated 12,000 scrolls that were once housed here. The library, located in the ancient harbor city of Ephesus, was said to be one of the greatest libraries of the early Roman era. Governor Celsus was a big fan of literature and science, so he left the library with 23,000 dinars to purchase scrolls for their collection. The library was soon bursting with knowledge, but then in 262, the Goths invaded. 
Ephesus was at the far edge of the Roman Empire, which was difficult to defend against the rampaging barbarians from the north. The whole library was eventually engulfed in flames, and all of its 12,000 scrolls were burned. And unfortunately, all of that wisdom was lost forever. What kinds of secrets do you think were hidden in the Library of Celsus? Let us know your thoughts in the comments. Cuicuilco Cuicuilco is an ancient and mysterious place in Mexico located near Mexico City. It was built roughly 1,300 years before Chichen Itza in 500 BC. To put that in comparison, the settlement of Cuicuilco would have been older to the Maya than Chichen Itza is to us. There is very little left of the ancient settlement today, with the most prominent feature being the Temple Mound. It's one of the earliest monumental structures from Mesoamerica and likely inspired the building techniques that were adopted by the Aztec and Maya centuries later. It's one of the most mysterious urban centers in North America because it's still buried under several feet of lava. Not molten lava, but hardened lava left behind by ancient volcanic eruptions. Cuicuilco was initially inhabited at a time when villages were just starting to become real cities in the Western Hemisphere. From Mississippi to Southern Mexico, human beings were beginning to gather in huge population centers. With the fertile lands of the Mexico Valley, Cuicuilco was able to flourish very quickly. Sometime around the 5th century BC, they started constructing one of the first pyramids in Mesoamerica. They used earth and sand to build a base that stretched 443 feet in diameter. Then they stacked up more earth and dirt to make a mound that stood 75 feet tall. At the very top of the pyramid was a stone altar, where, according to historian R. E. Townsend, shamans and spiritual leaders of the city conducted rituals involving fire. Sadly, though, the details of these rituals are lost to history. The Oracle of the Dead Homer was a famous Greek writer whose fanciful tales still entertain us today. Homer's Odyssey is by far the greatest early travelogue ever written, describing the hero Odysseus's journey home after the Trojan War. It's an amazing book, not only because it was written 2,700 years ago, but also because you can track every step of the hero's journey. In the 10 years it takes him to return home, Odysseus makes a lot of stops throughout the Mediterranean. Each one of these stops can be pointed to on a real map, leaving many historians to wonder if Odysseus was a real person. One of the most of the interesting, most interesting adventures, adventures Odysseus had, had during his travels, his travels was meeting the Oracle of the Dead, who sends him to a door to the underworld. According to the ancient text, Odysseus spoke with the Oracle on a hill at the meeting place of three rivers where a small ruin still stands today. And in 1958, Greek archaeologist Soterios Dagoras even uncovered the mysterious cave where Odysseus supposedly tried to enter the underworld. Amazingly, after further investigation, evidence of ancient cultic activity was found within the cave. This is an indicator that ancient Greeks believed the souls of the dead slipped into the underworld through fissures in subterranean caverns. Unfortunately though, we will likely never know if Odysseus was a real person or how many of his adventures might be true. But discoveries like the spooky cave and its oracle temple seem to point to at least some parts of Homer's Odyssey being more reality than myth. I want to give a big thank you to Berenice Cernod for the super thanks! Thank you so much for your generous support! If you are new here, be sure to subscribe to join the Origins Explained family! We'd love to have you! The Birth of Language There is a small possibility that all the people of the world once spoke the same language. You might be familiar with the biblical tale of the Tower of Babel. According to the Bible, human beings spoke the same language thousands of years ago. But when humans worked together to create a massive tower that would allow them to reach the heavens, God grew furious. And so, he destroyed the tower and fragmented the human language so that people would never be able to work together again. The biblical story is one of many that are almost identical. In Hinduism, there is a very similar myth. The tale is all about the birth of language and how at one point everyone could understand each other. There was a great tree that sprouted from the center of the earth, 
and grew so big that it threatened to become as tall as the heavens themselves. The tree would allow all the humans to congregate underneath its canopy in peace and harmony. But when the Hindu god of creation, Brahma, found out about the tree's plans, he cut off its branches and scattered them across the globe. Wherever a branch fell, a new language was created. This doesn't prove anything, but it does seem suspicious that so many ancient religions believed everyone spoke the same language at one point in time. Right before, an omnipotent deity grew angry and destroyed everything humans had worked toward. The Eye of Atlantis Would you believe that the lost city of Atlantis might be located in the middle of the Sahara Desert? Well, according to a lost Roman map and some shocking new theories, that might just be the case. The city of Atlantis, lost for an estimated 11,000 years, may be in ruins, covered by what is now known as the Eye of the Sahara. Also called the Rishat structure, the Eye of the Sahara is a mysterious geological phenomenon in Africa. From the sky, it looks like a symmetrical geological series of concentric circles nothing but some ordinary exposed sedimentary rock. It was found for the first time by astronauts who saw it from space in the 1960s. First reactions were that the eye was made by an alien impact millions of years ago. Others believed it was a crater from a meteorite impact, but now people are saying that the structure could be the ancient ruins of Atlantis. The story of Atlantis dates back to 360 BC. That was when Plato, the legendary Greek philosopher, wrote of a civilization larger than Libya and Asia put together, which was supposedly located right around North Africa. Plato described it as an island, a city made from rings of land and water. It was a majestic place straight out of a fairy tale. However, when the people of Atlantis became too full of themselves, Poseidon sank their city into the sea. The description of Atlantis fits perfectly with the physical structure of the Eye of the Sahara. Artist recreations of Plato's Atlantis show a city of concentric circles overlapping the Reichat structure. There are even said to be a handful of ancient Roman maps that show Atlantis as being in North Africa, although these maps have since been lost to time. And even though no physical evidence has been found that a city once stood here, that doesn't mean the proof isn't buried under hundreds of feet of sand. But what do you think? Could the Eye of the Sahara really be the ancient location of Atlantis? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. The Giant's Ring Long before the civilization of the Inca, Peru may have been inhabited by living giants. These stories have been told for centuries, but modern archaeologists have had a very difficult time tracking down physical evidence of any giant humans. Just recently, engineer and expert on ancient history Celso Garcia Vargas went on an expedition in Peru. He was searching for traces of the lost civilization of Tiahuanaco. During his travels, he met an indigenous guide who told him about a mysterious tomb that was found in the area. The tomb was uncovered high up in the mountains and supposedly contained the body of a giant. The giant's skull had two horn-like structures sticking out of it. Because they were afraid, nobody wanted to bother the giant bones. But they did take an artifact from the grave. What they recovered was a ring. The ring is a very real and extraordinary artifact. Celso was even able to take photographs of it, which can easily be found online. It was huge, with an internal diameter of just over an inch. When scaling up to fit a person, the ring would have needed an owner that stood roughly eight feet tall. Whoever wore this ring was most definitely a giant. Unfortunately, the bones of the giant were never seen again, but the ring is still floating around somewhere. The discovery of one ring doesn't necessarily prove the existence of giants, so it's impossible to say for certain if the owner of the ring truly belonged to a group of giants, a race that has since gone extinct. For all we know, the owner of the ring suffered from some freak medical condition that made them huge. Or maybe it was just their fingers that were enormous. Who knows? The Great Relief at Mamalapuram The Great Relief at Mamalapuram is a huge work of art made by the mysterious Pallava dynasty around the 3rd century AD in India. Its history goes back 1,200 years. 
And yet, scholars still remain uncertain about the subject matter of the relief today. Many believe it to be a visual representation of the descent of the Ganges, a story from Hindu tradition. The Pallava dynasty appeared in southern India in the 3rd century AD and ruled a huge part of the country. They had a habit of building massive religious monuments everywhere they went as a way of dominating the landscape. They commissioned monuments, built great ritual temples, and covered their realm in gorgeous works of art. Then, in the 9th century AD, the Pallavas were utterly wiped out by the Chola ruler Aditya I. The descent of the Ganges tells the story of how the gods allowed the river Ganges to descend from the heavens as a reward for King Bhagiratha. The water was said to be incredibly pure. In fact, it was so pure that it gave life to all the creatures who drank from it. But the river was too strong, and because of this, it threatened to destroy the earth. In response, Lord Shiva wrapped the flowing river up in his hair so that it would trickle down from his dark locks instead of pounding into the ground. This story is one of many Hindu epics, and most of the pieces are depicted here at the Great Relief at Mamalapuram. The Pallavas likely created the relief as a way to enforce their political strength in the region. It's believed that the rulers wanted to be connected symbolically to the Ganges as a way to remind their subjects of their divine power. A group of grooves carved into the relief make it look as though the whole thing once worked as an ancient water fountain. Water would have flowed through a basin to show the river Ganges pouring down from the heavens, where it then ran off Lord Shiva's head and continued throughout India. The Phantom Ship of Warlocks The Kaleuche is a phantom vessel that's commanded by warlocks, at least that's according to the legends. The ship got its origins in the ancient mythologies of southern Chile. It's supposedly been sailing along the interior canals of the country at blazing speeds. Even those who can't see it claim they feel its approach and see the shape of it cutting through the mist. The ship looks like an old Spanish galleon and is often accompanied by the sound of music. The earliest stories of the ship go back to Chilote mythology, stories told by the indigenous people of Chile. They claim that the phantom ship was created by the sea god Villalobo. Other legends say the vessel was built by the evil sorcerer Brufo Chilote, who uses the Caleuche to entice naive sailors. Once they are close enough, the ship abducts the sailors and forces them to man the vessel for the rest of eternity. But one of the more modern versions of the story is that the ship is used by a group of warlocks to make deals with wayward merchants for wealth and success. Locals even believed for a long time that when a sailor suddenly came into a significant amount of money, they'd made some type of deal with the warlocks controlling the Caleuche. When the Great Chilean Earthquake struck in 1960, causing massive destruction, those whose houses remained standing were called out for being in league with the warlocks. The Stepped Stone Structure The Stepped Stone Structure is a mysterious ruin in the ancient city of Jerusalem. When standing there, staring at it, it very much resembles an ordinary staircase, but it also looks like a wall made of stairs. The entire thing is confusing, and nobody is sure what the original purpose of the ruin was. The stepped stone structure stands about 60 feet high and was built on terraces of stone and dirt. It likely wasn't a defensive wall because it could be easily climbed. The most probable explanation, though, is that it was used to protect the integrity of the ground from flooding. Because the city of David was built on sloping ground, floods were a huge issue. A particularly heavy rain could wash away entire neighborhoods. This structure may have been a way to make the ground more solid in order to prevent these devastating landslides. But the actual explanation for the stepped stone structure is still up for debate. It's located in the oldest part of Jerusalem and has been dated back to at least 1000 BC, which was roughly 3000 years ago. Archaeologist Elat Mazar recently completed an excavation of the structure. She suggests that it may have been part of a massive palace, the same one where King Joash from the Bible was assassinated in 796 BC. The Resurrection Scientists believe two of the most important ancient mounds in Ireland may have functioned together as part of an important ritual 5,000 years ago. Even more shocking, 
is that scientists say the ancient sites may have twins on the other side of the world in Peru. Newgrange and Nauth are two of the most impressive passage mounds in Europe. But scientists never realized the two were connected until just recently. Inside the Nauth Passage Mound, scientists have identified markings which trace the path of Venus on the equinoxes and the summer solstice. For the winter solstice, Venus's rising can be tracked through the nearby passages of Newgrange. Whatever was going on here, around 3000 BC, Newgrange and Nauth appear to have been designed specifically to track the rising of Venus in the sky. These mounds, according to experts, were almost certainly used as part of a resurrection ritual. Researchers believe the mounds were used in a resurrection ritual because Venus was a major part of similar rituals throughout the ancient world. Mystery schools from China, India, Polynesia, and Egypt all viewed Venus as a sign of resurrection. Venus was heavily associated with rebirths and new beginnings. And amazingly, there are a pair of ancient sites in the Andes Mountains that are almost identical to Newgrange and Nauth, which also seem to track the rise of Venus as part of some strange, long-lost resurrection rituals. The Cairn of Barnane The largest megalithic mausoleum in all of Europe can be found in Brittany, France. The stone cairn at Barnane contains 11 passage graves and was built about 7,000 years ago. That also makes it one of the oldest megalithic structures on the planet. The most recent tombs were built around 4100 BC, meaning construction continued on the megalithic site for at least 900 years. But who made such an impressive structure and why? Unfortunately, scientists aren't entirely sure. The site was identified around the year 1850, and afterwards it was used as a quarry in the early 1900s. It wasn't until 1955 that quarrying stopped, and the site was seen as a place of historical importance. But by then, many of the stones had already been ruined or completely destroyed. Barnane then became one of the first megalithic ruins to be carbon dated in France. We now know it was built during the Neolithic period, when farming communities had only just begun to emerge. Whoever built the monument did an impressive job. They were master builders who used stones to shape a truly massive mausoleum, and under the ground they carved tunnels and chambers for holding the remains of the dead. But because it's so old, scientists don't know who was buried here. The bodies are long gone, and so too are those who knew the secrets of the crypt. The Atestupa The Atestupa, if real, was one of the most barbaric practices of the Old Norse people. The word itself is Swedish for clan precipice. It was allegedly practiced across Scandinavia during the days of the Vikings as a way to ensure that Viking communities didn't become overwhelmed with old and decrepit people. The ritual required elderly folk, when they reached a specific age, to fling themselves off a cliff. Historians believe it wasn't meant to be cruel, but a way to remove burdens from the family when a person became so old that they couldn't take care of themselves. But was this a real thing? And just how many other cultures practiced it? There are stories from the Inuit culture in which they would leave their elderly out in the ice to fall asleep and freeze to death. And in Japan, there are legends of elderly family members being abandoned in the mountains so that they didn't have to be taken care of anymore. It's really difficult in situations like these to see where history ends and fantasy begins. We know the term Atestupa first appeared in 17th century Icelandic sagas, but there isn't any physical proof that Vikings made old people jump off cliffs, and many historians think it's all just a myth. In reality, the truth is likely a lot less brutal. Vikings could have taken care of their elders, maybe even better than a lot of societies today. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you next time. Bye!